Good morning, everyone. How are y'all? Good. <laughs> Could be better, right? Right? Some of you have already looked at your school performance ratings, and maybe that's the reason for the kind of very low tone here in the room. Um, I cannot say that assessment issues, particularly as they relate to accountability, are things that are exactly exciting, but I will do my darndest to make them as interesting and as informative as I can for you. Um, as Superintendent Hill noted, uh, there have been a lot of changes to statewide assessment over the last couple of years. Um, some changes have been all right, other changes have been a little less than all right, but they are what they are. And so we are now all living with the, the implications of those statewide assessment system changes. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about those changes. We're gonna talk about assessment program requirements as stipulated in IDEA, ESEA, and state statute. We'll talk some about the standard setting that we conducted this summer for both PAWS, SAWS, and the ACT. And then I hope to spend the bulk of my presentation talking about growth. We provide information in our school performance reports about growth, specifically about student growth percentiles, median growth percentiles, adequate growth percentiles. And I've heard people go, what? What is that? We're not Colorado, we're Wyoming. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start and talk a little bit about assessment program requirements. Uh, contrary to popular opinion, we do not make changes in our assessment system willy-nilly just because Deb Lindsay had some crazy idea. Um, we actually follow the requirements of both state and federal statute. So the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which has been around since the 1960s, authorized by LBJ uh, and the Congress that worked with him, requires annual testing in grades three through eight. That's under the iteration of ESEA, commonly known as No Child Left Behind. In uh, high school, we have to test in at least one grade. Some states choose to test in more. We test in just one grade. And those assessments must be in English language arts or reading and mathematics. ESEA also requires testing in science once in each grade span. That's why we have a science test at four, eight, and 11. In addition to federal statute, Wyoming state statute also requires a writing test. That writing test must be administered in grades three, five, and seven during a window that's different from pause. Wyoming state statute also requires explore, plan, and ACT plus writing in grades nine through 11, respectively. And the test at grade 11 serves as our federal accountability assessment. According to ESEA, all of our statewide assessments that measure performance uh, for uh, federal accountability must be aligned to the state's adopted content standards. States are required to provide evidence of that alignment to the state's adopted content standards. Under both ESEA and IDEA, uh, states are permitted to have alternate assessment for students with the most significant cognitive disabilities, often called the 1%. Those uh, assessments are also to be aligned to extensions of the statewide standards in English language arts, math, and science. Students with those significant cognitive disabilities must participate in the ALT. Um, that's aligned to those ALT standards. So we have statewide and federal statute requiring that our statewide assessment system have various components at specific grade levels. It requires an alternate assessment as well. Uh, what I didn't cover is that it requires that at least 95% of the students participate. So that 95% participation requirement that's part of the WAEA school performance reports isn't new. That requirement has been around actually since the precursor to No Child Left Behind, IASA, Improving America's Schools Act. So why did we make changes to the pause in 2014? These changes in pause that resulted in much lower proficiency rates across the board. Why did we do that? As I noted, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act requires that statewide assessments be aligned to the state's adopted content standards. In Wyoming in 2012, after a lengthy review process, we adopted new statewide standards in language arts and mathematics, which are the Common Core State Standards. Those standards were adopted and shortly after that adoption, the, the Folks who were in the assessment division at the time, before I ever even arrived, began working with the testing vendor, Educational Testing Services, to put together a plan to transition PAWS to 
uh, fully address the state's adopted content standards. And so this Venn diagram that you see here shows the plan very loosely, not drawn to scale. But in 2013, there was, of course, some alignment between the state's adopted standards, the Common Core state standards, and the pause tested content. It's not like the Common Core state standards were entirely different in language arts and math than we had previously adopted. By 2014, the spring of 14 test, all of the pause items were aligned to the Common Core. We had no state standards, or I mean no items on the test that were not measuring uh, Common Core state standards. By 2015, our test will complete its full transition to align to the Common Core state standards because the field tested items from 2014 will become operational items on the 2015 test. And that way we will be assessing all of the Common Core state standards in ELA and math that we can given our restriction to multiple choice only items. Statute requires our test or pause to be multiple choice only. So we know that there are some Common Core state standards in both language arts and math we cannot assess or cannot assess fully at the right depth of knowledge because of this limitation to multiple choice only items. So when we pull together teachers to help us decide where to put the cuts, one of the things we looked at, which y'all can't really see very well, I apologize for that, is um, uh, NAEP data. As you know, we administer the NAEP every other year. The spring of 15, in case you aren't aware, is another NAEP year. So if you haven't been contacted already by Will Donkers, good, you will soon. Uh, we presented information about the difference between performance on the NAEP and performance on our statewide assessment. Some of you have seen this before. This, uh, the yellow highlighted bar that y'all can't read very well, shows Wyoming's performance here. We have performance reported on the NAEP and this is in fourth grade reading, to be uh, 37%. 37% of the students in Wyoming in the 2013 test were proficient in reading. Now that's a lot lower than y'all remember your proficiency rates being on the pause in that same year. Yep. In fact, if you follow the bar all the way to the top, that shows you what the performance was reported on the pause. So the performance on the pause was, was more than twice as high in terms of proficiency rate than it was on an eight. They're both assessing reading, the same constructs in reading, literal and inferential comprehension. Yet and still, there was a huge gap in the percent of students proficient on an eight versus our statewide test. And you say, why is that? Well, so part of the reason for that huge gap which by the way exists also in eighth grade. This happens to be math, but it doesn't matter. I could have presented uh, eighth grade reading or fourth grade math. The gaps are very similar. That is our rates of proficiency on our statewide test are much higher than they are reported on the NAEP. Well, why is that? So one of the reasons is that NAEP was intended to uh, provide information for an entirely different purpose. While the pause was intended to provide data for school accountability, under No Child Left Behind and its precursors under ESEA. NAEP data are not used for school accountability. As a matter of fact, we don't get school level data at all. We only get statewide data. So the purpose of the assessments are very different. The NAEP is used to get a general dipstick of student performance across the country and then to produce information about how are students performing state by state, overall, in aggregate and by different student groups, English learners, African Americans, white students, poor students, etc. But it doesn't give us information by school and not used for school accountability. So the purposes are very different and so when the standard setting panelists got together for the NAEP many years ago and set performance cuts, decided how much students needed to know and be able to do in order to be called proficient on the NAEP, they set a much higher standard. And they set a much higher standard because the implications of low proficiency rates, the stakes for low proficiency rates, weren't at all the same as they are for school accountability under ESEA. But still, 
the skills are the same. What we want for students to know and be able to do at grade four or at grade eight in reading or math is the same, whether we're talking about uh, results on the NAEP or we're talking about results on statewide pause. So many states, as you can see, are in the same boat as Wyoming. It's not like Wyoming is a standout outlier there and we're the only ones that have really high proficiency rates on our own statewide assessment and lower proficiency rates on the NAEP. Most states are that way. There are only a few states that are not. In the context of uh, setting standards in 2014, and the assessment consortia will be doing the same thing. Other states that have also adopted the Common Core State Standards are doing the same thing. They're looking for ex, uh, extant reference points, like the NAEP, to help ground their decisions. So if we set the cut point here, because this is the kind of content we expect for students to know and be able to do, what is the impact data? What percent of our students would be called proficient or be classified as proficient if we set the cut score here? And how does that relate to performance on the net? Because that's often called the gold standard for, for uh, educational assessment. So we conducted in the summer pause and saw standard setting as well as in the first week of August standard setting for the ACT. Many of you on conference calls that we held a month or so ago asked us, well, why didn't we set standards for grade three? We didn't set standards for grade three because even though we have a grade three SAWS, we did not set standards on it yet because it's a year behind in terms of development. We have to include the response to text items that we field tested just this past year on the operational test and then we'll set, we'll set a performance cuts. So we're one year behind in development for SAWS, uh, but we did set cut scores on SAWS at grades five and seven. Our plans were developed for standard setting for all three assessments, and they were developed by the WDE along with its testing contractors, both Educational Testing Services and ACT, and reviewed quite closely by the Technical Advisory Committee. Like other states, Wyoming has a TAC, a Technical Advisory Committee, comprised of individuals with a great deal of expertise and national reputation in the area of educational assessment, educational measurement, and how they relate to school accountability. So on our standard setting panels, as we convene them, you may recall, how many of you get our assessment newsletter? Raise your hand. And most of you should raise your hand because we send it to all principals. So everyone who's a principal should be getting our nearly weekly, weekly assessment update. So when we send those out, you uh, will recall that last spring, early summer, we had multiple, multiple, multiple calls Please have your teachers sign up. We're looking for experts in the, in the Common Core State Standards, people who have deep experience teaching specific grade levels of students with an interest in either reading or math who can help us set standards. So we don't go into a smoke-filled room and make up some numbers that we think look good. We invite teachers to participate, to advise us about where they think the cuts ought to be. So those participants included Wyoming teachers for the pause and saws. For the ACT, we also included school administrators, a counselor, and a couple of higher education representatives. The focus of the Common Core State Standards is based on this notion of college and career readiness. And so we wanted to make sure that in the ACT standard setting, for purposes of what's called vertical articulation, that is the degree with which you have people who are helping to make recommendations who have experience sort of below that grade level, so we had an eighth grade teacher participate in our ACT standard setting panel, as well as on the upper end. So we had some higher education representatives. The judgments that individuals made as panelists for both PAWS and SAWS were standards based. That is to say, they looked at the performance level descriptors that had been developed for both reading and math. And performance level descriptors, recall, are those descriptions of student performance at each performance level. So in order to earn a score of, say, advanced in grade five math, what is it that students need to know and be able to do? They need to know and be able to do a little bit less to be called proficient at that same grade, and even less to be called basic. But so those are specific descriptions based on the standards that we've adopted about what students must know and be able to do in order to earn a score in basic, proficient, or advanced. The ACT judgments of the panelists were empirically based. 
That is to say, they were presented with outcome data about participants nationally as well as in Wyoming. What percent of students with a score of, say, 20, 23, 21, were, uh, had a 75% probability of going on to college? We know this because we have National Student Clearinghouse data, so we can look at those probabilities. What percent of students, say, with a score of 23 in science achieve an A or a B or a C or better with a 75% probability or maybe a 50% probability? Those are the kind of data that our standard setting panelists look at on the ACT. Regardless of ACT pause or saws, consistent with the experience of other states in standard setting, aligned to the Common Core, we um, saw that this set of different expectations articulated in our standards resulted in lower proficiency rates. And probably nearly everyone in this room saw lower proficiency rates in at least one grade, and maybe all your grades in your school. So that baseline data from 2014 uh, indeed results in, uh, uh, because we have different, expect different expectations in our test, results in lower proficiency rates. That we know. Our messaging from the beginning about this, many, many months ago, in the last year, we've been talking about 2014 sets an entirely new baseline. Results are not directly comparable to prior years. The tests themselves are substantively different. That's why we had to set new performance cuts. That's why we had to break scale. So we set an entirely new scale, developed entirely new performance level descriptors, and set new cut scores based on those PLDs. So the results are not directly comparable. New baseline, we're looking forward. And as we look forward, that focus is on continuous improvement. We know that our student performance will improve over time as districts continue to implement the new standards. Districts are in varying stages of implementation of the standards. Um, a year, well, about two years ago when I first came, there were some districts that had barely begun to scratch the surface. Districts that said, oh, it looks like this isn't going to go away, these Common Core State Standards, so we need to start implementing them. And with some of them, they had only begun to be, uh, build awareness uh, among their teachers of the major shifts in the standards. So what's different in the new standards versus the old standards? Other districts by the fall of 2012 had already been implementing the Common Core for a year or two. So that means teachers had already had an opportunity to develop lesson plans. Uh, district and, and school staff had already had an opportunity to examine curriculum scope and sequence, identify potential gaps, fill in those gaps where necessary. So districts all across the state are in varying stages of implementation, but we do know uh, consistent with the experience with YCAS in days past, that student performance will improve as teachers become more comfortable implementing the standards, more familiar with them, and as students become more familiar with them. In WAEA, um, as Julie outlined, the, the, the purpose of, of the act itself was outlined in maybe eight bullets or something like that. WAEA also outlines the primary purpose of assessment in Wyoming. So I didn't just make this up. Um, but the first purpose of assessment in Wyoming, according to, to WAEA, is to support improved teaching and learning. The second is school and program improvement, which kind of goes hand in hand with improved teaching and learning. And thirdly, measuring performance indicators the indicators of growth and equity and achievement and readiness under WAEA. So I know that sometimes it doesn't feel as if the assessment system is designed to support improved teaching and learning, but I do pledge to you that we uh, will increasingly provide reports that will do a better job of helping you use the statewide assessment data to identify areas of strengths and needs. In the next couple of weeks, we'll release what's called a domain report. Domains are those kind of subcategories under the overall heading of math or reading. So in mathematics, you'll see scale scores like you saw in individual student reports in algebra, in, um, in uh, geometry, in stats and probability that will help you identify by grade overall areas of strengths and need within your school. 
Those reports should be released in the next couple of weeks and we will, like always, announce them in our nearly weekly, weekly assessment update. So looking forward, what's going on for 2015? Um, uh, last week I was in San Antonio with uh, our vendor, ETS, and the rest of my assessment colleagues. We, um, I got a phone call from a school district and the person asked me, so what is the statewide assessment system for 2015? And while I'm happy to answer those calls, and I do, it does kind of worry me that at this stage in the game, there's at least one person out there who doesn't yet know what we're administering for 2015. So I thought, well, even though 99% of you may know this information, for the person or two in the room who doesn't know, there were no changes to state statute in the 2014 legislative session, so that means by default, we are continuing pause, grades three to eight, with our current assessment blueprints, which are on our website, and the summer of 2014 cut scores. There are no changes to those cut scores or the assessment blueprints. We're going to continue SAWS at all three grades, three, five, and seven. We're gonna use the summer of 2014 cuts for grades five and seven, and shortly after the window closes for SAWS, we'll be setting performance cuts uh, for grade three. And we plan to release pause data separately from SAWS so that sometime in the month of June, you will have a pause data file to download from Fusion. How many of you think that's better than September? Okay, okay. Um, as Superintendent Hill noted, we are adopting a new alternate assessment beginning in 2015. Um, one of the things that has bothered me enormously since I got here, because my background is working with kids and adults with significant, really significant cognitive and physical disabilities, what's really bothered me is that our alternate assessment, I felt, was really substandard, really inferior, particularly when contrasted with the rest of our statewide assessment system. Our alternate assessment wasn't nearly good enough. Um, and our kids deserve better. And so I began searching for alternatives for an alternate assessment that would cost us far less money. Our alternate assessment for about 600 kids in our state had cost us about a million dollars. $600 a test is a lot of money. And so I began searching for a more robust but less expensive alternative. And we found one, I'm happy to say we found one. We're collaborating with several other states in uh, implementing this alternate assessment. So we'll have the benefit of a whole bunch more data to be used as items are developed and field tested. But this new alternate assessment, we're calling the Y-ALT, not why do we administer it, because I already told you why we administer it, the law requires it. So it's the Wyoming alternate assessment. Uh, it's not an ALT to pause, it's not an ALT to the ACT or Explorer plan, it's the Y-ALT. And that assessment will be rolled out this year. We'll watch for training on it. It will have um, its own TOMS-like system. So please watch from us information about uh, signing up for webinars on that TOMS-like system, which by the way is called TIDE. Um, so we have TOMS and TIDE uh, for the Y-ALT. Um, we are gonna be using, continuing to use the new Wyoming ACT scale which was approved by our technical advisory committee for the cut scores that we need to use for WAEA as well as federal reporting. Believe me, if we could have used the traditional ACT scale, we would have. Um, but in our effort to ensure that we are providing the most accurate information to schools, we created a separate Wyoming ACT scale, which we can talk about later if we need to, um, that is far more accurate in terms of providing information for school accountability. So I'm going to segue now to a discussion of growth. Um, but before I go on, are there questions on upcoming statewide assessment, about standard setting? Of, oh, any questions on statewide assessment so far? Okay, so the question is, um, since ACT is doing away with Explore and Plan, we'll have a hole in our statewide assessment system for grades nine and 10, 
beginning in 2016. And um, that is all true. And it's also true that I don't yet know what we will do. I have apprised uh, the Select Committee on Education Accountability that we will not be able to, beyond 2015, administer, explore, and plan, even at that lovely 40% premium. Um, so uh, there have been some folks who said, so does that mean we're going to be implementing Aspire? Not necessarily. Um, I would love to be able to tell you that I know exactly what we're doing in 2016, but that would be a lie. So the truth is, I don't yet know what our statewide assessment system looks like in 2016. Uh, and, and not just for grades 9 and 10, I mean the whole shooting match. I do not know. And it's a little embarrassing to stand here as your state assessment director and tell you, I don't know what we're doing in the spring of 16, but that is the truth. Um, uh, for a lot of different reasons, we're not necessarily in the driver's seat with regard to statewide assessment system changes, uh, revisions. Uh, it looks, though, like the select committee is interested in convening a panel of constituents across the state to provide feedback to them about what our statewide assessment system ought to look like. And I can also tell you that our contract with Educational Testing Services carries us through the spring of 16 administration if we need to. Now, we can terminate that contract if the legislature does something different, um, but we um, are working toward and planning for a spring 16 administration of PAWS and SAWS, just as we uh, plan for 2015. Um, and I'm planning for implementation of the ACT at grade 11. Um, but none of that is a certainty. I can only tell you I have a contract for PAWS and SAWS through the spring of 16, and um, that the legislature may choose to do something different and is talking now about convening a group of stakeholders. Other questions? There are no stupid questions. It's really OK. It's a lot of people kind of talking to each other. Any questions that you have of me? No? Well, you know where to find me. So if you do have questions, by all means, ask. And, um, or if it occurs to you later when I'm talking about something else, just interrupt me. I'm okay with that. All right. So then let's go on and review um, the growth information. As Julie's already highlighted, the elementary and middle school accountability system, the school performance reports contain three indicators, achievement, growth, and equity. For most years moving forward, growth information will be included in the equity indicator. Mike will talk in more detail about what we're doing this year for equity since we um, aren't able to use adequate growth percentiles this year. So most of the time that I'm going to spend, uh, most of the rest of my time with you this morning is going to be talking about growth. How many of you, please raise your hands, ha um, saw one of our growth presentations last year? Mike, Leslie, and I kind of did a road show and um, did some training on growth. So a few of you. So these slides will be very familiar to you, so I apologize to those of you who have already seen it before. Hopefully it will just sort of cement your understanding of what you know about growth in our accountability model. But for the rest of you, this will be new information, and so that's good. Hopefully after uh, today, you'll feel much better prepared to go back to your schools, explain your school performance report in some detail, and with some confidence to your staff and your buildings. So today we're going to talk about the growth indicator and that applies for elementary and middle school. So first let's talk a little bit about growth um, relative to this notion of proficiency. In a standards-based world, it's perfectly appropriate and actually quite logical to say we have the standard and we've set this performance expectation. What percent of our kids have met it? Seems kind of logical. Um, if you're the United Way fundraiser in your community and you've set a target for $300,000 in terms of fundraising, you periodically examine how close you are to meeting that bar of $300,000. That seems like a good thing. It helps you know whether or not you need to push harder or um, whether or not you need to celebrate, whatever it is. So in a standards-based world, measuring students' performance against an established expectation or content standard makes total sense. It answers the question for us, is John proficient, or loosely on grade level, in grade six mathematics? 
What percent of his peers are proficient? What percent of the sixth graders in our district are proficient? How does that compare to the statewide average of students in grade six proficient in grade six mathematics? Those are important questions. Everybody wants to know that. Using the same set of data without administering any other assessments, we can examine in a really technical way how much growth students are making over time using our scale scores from one year to the next. And that allows us to say fairly precisely how much did John improve in mathematics, say, from grade five to six, compared to what we call his academic peers. His academic peers, for purposes of growth in the Wyoming accountability model, is his uh, academic peers are those students who started out in roughly the same place, that is, got roughly the same scale score in grade five. So that's academic peers. So why do we do that? Well, for one thing, I think it makes a lot of sense. Classroom teachers, and virtually everyone in this room has been a classroom teacher. Classroom teachers uh, think about students' growth all the time. They think about, if you ask them to think about uh, any particular student who, about whose progress they're particularly proud, they can identify dozens of kids. Oh, I remember Susie, who started out like way below grade level. <clears throat> she came to my classroom four years ago and she was so far below grade level. And man, by the time we got to the end of the year, she was so close to grade level. I brought her up like three grade levels. It was just amazing the progress she made. And teachers ought to be rightly proud of that accomplishment that they made with the student and her family. That's important. Teachers intuitively understand the importance of growth, the power of growth. But all along under NCLB, we've had this longitudinal assessment system and haven't used the data longitudinally to look at student performance over time. In fact, we've only looked, for the most part, cohort by cohort. Last year, 63% of our kids were proficient in math. This year, 67% of our kids are proficient in math. We must have had a four percentage point growth. That's a four percentage point improvement. It's not growth per se. We're looking at growth of the individual students from one year to the next. <clears throat> What's cool about growth indicators is that it measures performance, growth information for students at all levels of the spectrum. It doesn't just focus on low performing students or really high performing students or students in the middle. It looks at growth for every single student, regardless of their starting place and then compares each student's growth with that academic peer group, other students who started out either really low, middle, or high achieving. It reinforces the concept that even if you're really low achieving, say your rates of proficiency are only 25%, even students when you have 75% of them below expectations for that grade, all of them can grow and most of them do from one year to the next. At the other end of the spectrum, you um, all have parents of kids who are talented or gifted or identified as such, or the parents have identified them as such. And the parents will ask you, you know, how much did, did my child grow? Because I really want to know. It's part of the, the reason that people are so, um, so embrace math because it gives them that growth information, that's continuous scale score from one year or one administration to the next within a school year. People really like that because it reinforces this notion of growth and for all students at every part of the spectrum. Um, uh, some of you know that before I came to Wyoming, I worked in Milwaukee as the director of research and assessment there. And there are many, many, many persistently low performing schools in Milwaukee, not unlike many urban centers. And in Milwaukee, when I would go do presentations with school staff about growth, and particularly if I came to schools, and I kid you not, there are schools in Milwaukee where not one child, even under a lower set of expectations, not one child is proficient. They're either basic or in Wisconsin, it was called minimal, but below basic. And I would go there and I'd talk with them about growth and people would say, yeah, but our kids are really low performing so they can't, 
they're, they're just not going to be able to, you know, ever exceed expectations. No, low achieving kids can and do grow. At the other end of the spectrum, I'd go to some high achieving schools. There weren't many, but there were some. And I'd go to high achieving schools, and our teachers there in the high achieving schools would say, yeah, our growth there was only um, adequate. It wasn't exceeding expectations, like we always exceed expectations on achievement indicators, the percent of students proficient. But of course we don't exceed expectations on growth, because after all, our kids are already so high achieving, they don't have that much room to grow. In the growth model that we use, all students can and do show evidence of growth. A student who scores at the 95th percentile uh, in our test, you may have noticed this, this year, provides uh, percentile information where students are relative to other kids in the state in addition to the proficiency rate and in addition to the student growth percentile, so not to confuse those two. But we can have really high achieving kids, kids are scoring in the advanced range, scoring better than the vast majority of their kids who have really low growth and other kids scoring really, really high who have very high growth. Why? Because their performance, the performance of those really high achieving kids is only compared to other students who are really, really high achieving. So compared to that subset of students, their growth can e be either high, medium, or low. So, oh, Leslie. Oh, she left. Yes. <laughs> so one of the reasons that I am a real big fan of growth aside from the fact that it's intuitively appealing to classroom teachers because that's really what they focus on every day, is that our old system, or the system of reporting on attainment for proficiency rates only, the achievement indicator, um, doesn't tell the whole story. As I said earlier, it gives you an important piece of information, but it does not tell you the whole story. And so here's a good example. Here's a student who scored in the low end of the basic range in grade four, pause reading, could be any year. This is just a hypothetical example. Um, and then in grade five, scored at the high end of the basic range, and look at how much growth he made. A lot, right? Student grew an awful lot in terms of scale score points. But under No Child Left Behind, under the AYP system, when we measure proficiency rates only, does the school get any credit for that growth? No, no not at all. Not at all. Get absolutely not a zilch, zero, nothing. That's a lot of growth to get absolutely no credit for. It's counterintuitive. You've made a lot of improvement and you don't get any credit for it. Doesn't seem right. Similarly, if you have a student who's scoring at the low end of the proficient range, one year, I'm, I'm sorry, in the middle of the proficient range in the first year, say grade four, and in year two makes absolutely no progress, zero, zilch, nada, nothing. Terms of scale score, exactly the same. But happens because of the way that the uh, performance levels overlap in terms of scale score ratings, that student is still proficient. So here's a student that you get full credit for, still, first year and second year, because he's still scoring in the proficient range. That doesn't seem right either, absolutely no progress. And you still get full credit for him. So this is why growth makes a lot of sense. We have found over the years, and I don't mean just we, I mean the big research we, have found that growth in and of itself is not correlated with proficient status. Low achieving kids can grow at high rates. High achieving kids grow at low rates. Growth gaps can narrow between student groups. This is why we have an equity indicator where we look at the performance of the non-proficient students. In other states that are more diverse than Wyoming, they'll look at performance of different student groups in the more traditional sense students of color, students in poverty, students who are disabled, students with, uh, who are English learners, that kind of thing. But we aren't that diverse. 
Most of our schools are not that diverse. And so we've devised an indicator that instead has this consolidated subgroup, which is non-proficient students. And the whole point, really, is to ensure that schools have some focus on their students who are lowest achieving, the students who are most vulnerable, to make sure that schools have implementation programs in place, whether it's RTI or some kind of intervention program, to help those low achieving students grow quickly enough to become proficient. So, I'm going to hang on to this one. Just might need it again. All right, so one of our terms that we use is student growth percentiles, SGPs. SGPs are a normative measure. It compares any particular student with other like performing students. That's that notion of academic peers that I already mentioned. Academic peers are students who started out roughly in the same place you did in terms of scale scores in the first year, in the prior year. So the student growth percentile produces a relative percentile score, say 70%, that tells the student that she or he scored equal to or better than 70% of the students who had scores just like him in the previous year across the state. And then median growth percentiles, MGP, are used to summarize the student growth percentiles across classes, grades, and schools. And Leslie will show you how that uh, shows up in your reports. Adequate growth percentiles, although we're not reporting them in 2014 because of our change in cut scores, uh, they will return with our 2015 student perform or school performance reports. But basically, as Julie briefly mentioned, this answers the question, how much growth does a student have to make in order to reach proficiency by the end of eighth grade or within three years, whichever one comes first. Um, having good growth is obviously good. Having growth better than the statewide aver average for your academic peer group is a good thing, but if you're still eight years away from proficiency, then it's, then it's not as good as it sounds. So we want to make sure that kids are on the right track to become proficient within a reasonable period of time, three years. Whenever a student growth percentile is equal to or greater than the adequate growth percentile, which you could think of as a target, then you know the student is on track. So, Imagine for an instant that we have um, a student's pause scores over time, and this is just one student made up scale. These aren't real numbers. And by the way, the fact that we changed the scale is completely irrelevant to the, the computation of student growth percentiles. The good thing is that student growth percentiles are completely agnostic about the shift in scale. We could use one scales test and another scale and another test and do student growth percentiles across those two tests without actually any problem. Seems a little odd, but if you wrap your head around it, you're just comparing a student's growth from one year to the next compared to other students like him. So how are other students like him compared to the score on the first test, regardless of what that test is. This particular example uh, pretends as if the scores are all on the same scale, but the principle is the same. So this particular student in grade three achieved a scale score of 425. Next year, 455. By the way, this is a good thing. Our scale has, uh, our saw, uh, pause scale has what's called a vertical scale. That is to say we expect students' scores to go up, their scale scores to increase each and every year. When they don't increase, that's ungood. Okay. So we want scale scores to increase each and every year. So 425 to 455, you think, oh, well, that's, that's good. That was a 30-point um, gain. You don't really, with this information, we don't know how good it is relative to the standard. I don't have the PLDs here, nor do I have the score ranges associated with those PLDs. So for all I know, the student is um, below basic and continues to be below basic. But we do know that he made progress. But we don't know how much progress he made compared to other kids who started out at 425. So we have no reference point. We don't know if this is good enough compared to the standard, and we don't know how good this growth is because we need the information from a whole bunch of other kids who started out at 425 in order to know if this growth is good. But on the surface, it's good that it increased instead of decreased or stayed the same. So how do we derive the student growth percentiles? 
Mike does not put all the numbers in a hat and pull out a number. There is a, a, a statistical program uh, called R that has this model all completely baked into it. And with student scores entered into it, it tells us, oh, for a student who started out at 425, ended up at 455, here's the distribution of other students like him, hence these other little bubbles. Okay, these are other students who started out at 425. One student scored higher. I think this would be all students across the state, right? So there'd be a whole bunch of bubbles. Um, but in this hypothetical example, you can see that this student who started out at 425 ended up at 455 actually grew more than other students who started out at 425, more than most of them. So with that reference point, now we have a little bit more information. In fact, the student scored at the 82nd percentile. So his student growth percentile would be 82 in this hypothetical example, because he scored better than 82% of the students who started out at his same place. But we recompute the student growth percentile each and every year uh, for students with different trajectories. So we look at a student who started, who had this scale score in history, and where did they end up in grade five? And now the, the comparison group is different because the kids who, uh, the students being compared against, now are only students with this kind of scale score history. Not necessarily exactly, but very similar score histories. Again, that term academic peers comes into play. So how did the student now score? When he was in fourth grade, that was nice. <clears throat> Andy Griffith joined us for a minute. Some of you are too young to know who Andy Griffith is, and that's kind of embarrassing for me, but. Um, so here we are. This particular student uh, is now only kind of right in the middle compared to his academic peers, students with this scale score history, he is now right around the middle. And the middle is always 50 because it's a normative measure. So the student's performance is compared to those with a similar scale score history. So let's look at it in tabular format. Here we have six students across Wyoming. They all started out in the same place in grade three. That is, they all got a 400. In grade four, not surprisingly, they had wildly divergent scale scores. We have one that stayed, uh, two that stayed the same, one that lost a lot of scale score points. Okay, this is ungood. You're not supposed to lose scale score points. This isn't so good either because you're supposed to gain scale score points. So each of these students has gained scale score points. In this particular case, this student gained 130 scale score points. And so you can see how they're compared only to other students who started out in the same place at 400. And given their very different patterns of change, I'm not going to say improvement because not everybody improved, um, some students are scoring really low, well below the 50th percentile, which is the mean. Um, and here we have the student scoring, the student who gained 130 scale score points grew more than 89% of the students who started out at 400. Everybody with me? Questions? This is really fundamental to the whole concept of student growth percentiles. Yes, Ms. Muchler. So Sue's asking the question about how long the student stays in that particular cohort. So for the computation of grade three to grade four, you're right, they are all in that one cohort. Their only scale score history, if you will, is their test score from grade three. Once we're calculating student growth percentiles for grade five, many of them will be, most of them probably, in different cohorts. They do not stay the same because then the test score history diverges, right? So you have this one grade three student with a scale score of 400 
and uh, in grade three and 318 in grade four. Now for the grade five student growth percentile, we'll have, depending on his grade five score, he's gonna be compared to other kids with a scale score history of 400 and 318 and then whatever his fifth grade score is. So the cohorts change each and every year. We recompute them and the cohorts do indeed change each and every year. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? One question that I get is um, about student growth and how can we expect student growth when kids are very near the top of the range? About growth for those advanced kids? Uh, the advanced kids are only compared to other students who are really high scoring, just like them. So even if they don't have a lot of range in terms of scale score points to grow, if they are very near the top of the range, they're still compared only to other really high achieving kids. So some really high achieving kids drop a scale score point or two. Some gain five or 10. Many only gain a few. But they're still compared only to their academic peers. So a few points to remember. Student growth percentiles then, because their percentiles, range from 1 to 99, always. If you see a report that has a student growth percentile of it on 105, then you need to call us because something is awry. 1 to 99. Student growth percentiles compare students' current pause score with students throughout the state, not in terms of proficiency, not in terms of proficiency, but in terms of their growth from one year to the next. Each year we recalculate in reference to other students with the same test taking sequence and score history. So let's look at this particular example, Susie. What can we infer from Susie's fifth grade scale score? She got a scale score, if y'all can't read that, of 365 uh, in grade five. It was 300 in grade four and it was 270 in grade three. Her student growth percentile associated with her fifth grade score is 70. What, can we t uh, what do we know about her fifth grade scale score? <laughs> Kevin said the opposite of ungood. It is, it's the opposite of ungood because in fact uh, there are 65 scale score points increased from grade four to grade five. And we know that, that, that Susie scored uh, her growth between grade four and grade five was equal to or better than 70% of her um, fifth grade peers who started out with that same test score history. What do we know about her proficiency relative to the standards? Can I tell whether or not Susie's proficient from this information? Jeannie says no, and Jeannie knows. No, we don't know. Why don't we know whether or not Susie's proficient? We knew she grew a lot. Why don't we know whether or not she's proficient? What do we need? We need the scale score ranges, right? We don't have any idea. She might not be proficient. She might be below basic for all we know. We do know she, grow, she grew a lot, but she might be below basic. So we need the scale score ranges with each performance level. Then we'll know what proficiency category she's in. Uh, we already talked about this. What we, can we tell from Susie's growth percentile of 70? And at grade five, she outperformed 70% of the students in terms of growth, not proficiency, with similar score histories. All right, can we calculate her growth percentile just by knowing her previous scores? No, no, I see some heads shaking, no. Why, what are we missing? I'm kind of deaf, you'll have to speak louder. Similar scores? Right, we need the information from her academic peers. Exactly. Um, we absolutely need her academic peers. Couldn't do it without them. All right, so let's look at uh, some more information. Here we have Susie with her test score history that we've already looked at and her student growth percentile, along with several other students, Victor, Emily, Dante, Jamar, Maya, and Zachary all with different test score histories, different student growth percentiles. 
So Jamar has a student growth percentile, but Dante does not. Why is that? They're both missing a test score. Um, Jamar didn't test when he was in grade three. Right, so we need two consecutive years of test scores, absolutely. So uh, Jamar has a student growth percentile associated with his fifth grade score, but if we were looking instead at his fourth grade score, he would not have a student growth percentile. Why not? Because he needed both his third grade and his fourth grade. So uh, Dante doesn't have one because he's missing the middle score. So let's look at Zachary, who started out at 420, went to 450, and then went to 440. Should Zachary's teacher be concerned about his performance, given his scale score and his growth percentile? Yes, and why? What if he's scoring in the advanced range? That's right, even if he were advanced, we don't know if he is, but just suppose because it makes it a little more interesting, just suppose he is advanced. He hasn't hardly grown at all relative to other really high achieving kids. So whether he's low, medium, or high achieving, whether he's advanced or below basic or somewhere in between, his growth is very, very low relative to other students with similar test score histories. And that's a problem. Okay. Um, so let's look at a few rules of thumb we have here. Typical student growth percentiles are between about 40 and 60. The, the middle is 50, of course. Our school performance reports. Mike, is this still true? Um, I haven't looked at this, the SPRs um, today. Greater than or equal to 60 is exceeding. Did, did that stay the same with the PJP? 45? Okay, I'll, before we distribute this to y'all, I'll fix that. Um, 45 to 60 is meeting, and below 45 um, is uh, not meeting the standards, it's below the standard. Um, students in groups outside these ranges have either lower or higher typical growth. One important thing to remember is that there is some measurement error associated with measuring anything. Whether we're measuring the circumference of a door or we're measuring um, a shoe size or we're measuring student achievement, there is always, always, always measurement error. And so, um, as I like to say, if student growth percentile points are less than, are, are 10 or less, particularly for an individual student for one year to the next, do not get your undies in a bundle not that big of a deal. If, however, you see changes over time with maybe your grade in school and subject shows one year you're 45, which is just below the average, the next year you're 41, and the next year you're 36, you can begin to say, wow, there's a pattern here of decreasing performance, which is ungood. So, but for any particular student, um, uh, differences of uh, 10 or fewer student growth percentile points are likely not educationally meaningful. So, if my um, student growth percentile in math is um, 57 and, and Kevin's is 55, 50, <laughs> um, you're not gonna put me in this accelerated class and him in the middle class. It's just not significant, statistically significant. So um, again, growth is a concept that's very distinct from achievement as we measure it here. Try to train yourself to not use the word growth to refer to changes in proficiency rates. Increases in proficiency rates over time, refer to those as improvement, improvement in proficiency rates. Growth is a distinct concept, and technically, as we talk about it here in Wyoming, growth now means changes in scale scores from one year to the next. 
Each student is compared only to his statewide academic peers, not all students statewide. Students with a similar test score history, those academic peers. <coughs> we calculate the percentile on the change in achievement as measured by the scale score, not the absolute level. So we're not looking about whether or not a student is proficient or advanced or below basic. None of that matters when we're looking at uh, student growth percentiles. And then again, growth is subject, grade, and year specific. We recalculate them. So what's this median thing? For those of, do you need me to change that back? We'll make sure that y'all get copies of all the PowerPoints for sure. Median student growth percentile, if, if it's been a number of decades since you taught mathematics or since your undergraduate stats class, you will be reminded here on this slide that median is, is a measure of central tendency that just means nothing more than the middle number. <laughs> it's the middle number. So imagine that you have ordered all of your students, student growth percentiles from high to low or low to high, doesn't really matter. Um, and the point where 50% of the students are above and 50% are below, the middle, is the median score. That's all it is. And we use the median score as we report growth in the school performance reports. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, I want to open it up now to questions. How does all this uh, become affected by changes in the assessments? So earlier, um, so uh, John asked how, how do the growth calculations get affected by the changes in the assessment system? And the good thing is uh, the student growth percentile calculations are completely agnostic. They do not care if you've changed the test from one year to the next. We're looking at, and we can look at one scale one year, another scale another year. Student growth percentile system doesn't care if the test has changed. It's just looking for how much change there's been from one year to the next um, compared to, for each individual student compared to other students with similar score histories even if the test in the prior year was different from the test in the current year. Yes? Dan, just to clarify, make sure, on, so for the pause this year, are we testing all of the standards or are we using the blueprint again? Yes, so that's a great question. So when we set standards this year, this summer, we set standards on using the 2014 and the 2015 test, which you all haven't seen, of course. But we pre-built the 2015 test so that we could, in fact, say that we were setting standards on the full gamut of our standards. Um, uh, one of our colleagues from ETS called it a synthetic form, but in fact, it's the real form. We used all the field test data, created the, form for 2000, the forms for 2015, and used those data in standard settings. So both the operational tests for 2014 and field test items for 15 were designed. The blueprints are posted on the webpage for 2015, and you should be able to find them. Um, in mathematics, there are no changes whatsoever in the blueprint. Um, you'll, but uh, on our webpage, we just recently reorganized it so that even now I can find something on our webpage. So um, the assessment pages now have uh, a number of tools and resources, including the blueprints at each grade level and released items, by the way. So if you're wondering how we're measuring, I don't know, geometry and spatial shapes at grade eight, you'll be able to see items there that are, have been released that help you understand how we're assessing certain skills, knowledge, abilities. Um, and we'll release a new set of test questions um, probably December, January-ish. It just takes us that long to be sure that we're not accidentally putting something out there, releasing, that we really need to use on a test form later. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yes.
right? So the question is about how we, um, how we report to parents student growth percentile information because it's not in fact printed on our ISRs, the individual student reports. And we do provide in the Fusion download each individual student's student growth percentile in both reading and math. We encourage you to, as you have student conferences this fall, talk with the parents about individual student reports from the ISRs, have also that information on student growth so that they have a sense of how uh, their child has improved over time. The I, because uh, the student growth percentiles are not calculated by ETS, ETS doesn't have that data to report on the ISR. We have the data, we calculate it separately, we report it in Fusion to you all, but we don't print it on the report. We have had some conversations internally about the potential for creating an individual student report in Fusion that you all could download that would have that student growth percentile information. And so we plan to produce those so that you have that information. But right at this moment, those reports aren't ready. So if you want to be on the task force to help us figure that out, I'm looking for volunteers. Sure. There you go, sign up with Leslie. Because we absolutely have that on the docket of things to do because we know it would be helpful. Way better than you trying to, or a teacher trying to sit there with a parent saying, okay, here's your ISR, and let me check this spreadsheet to see what the student growth percentile is. That's not very parent-friendly. Uh, we do have a, a report that will be available next year that is really a high student report for growth. Absolutely. Because, because there's no projections this year. It really doesn't work. So um, what Mike said is that uh, the report that we will have in the future um, uh, longer term, next year, will have student growth percentile projections. It'll be similar, you may have seen, those of you who've worked in other states where they use um, the Colorado growth model may recall sort of the FAN report. Not unlike the MAP report, actually, the student growth report in, in the MAP system, um, uh, shows the student's trajectory and where you would expect him to be and then plots his actual test score um, on that potential FAN of options for a student. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Where are we at? I know we maybe only have one more year, but uh, skill scores on planet and explore so we can do some growth uh, at the high school level. Because right now it really seems kind of iffy when you're looking at, okay, those little kids on planet and how they score on HP is a division that we don't have. Right. So um, the question is, when are we going to get some kind of a Wyoming ACT scale score for Plan and Explore? And we don't intend to produce Wyoming ACT scale scores for Plan and Explore because Plan and Explore is going away. Um, and what we've suggested to schools is that for those of you who want to use Plan and Explore data to identify students as a part of what we hope is a whole other array of data about a student, to identify students who might not be on track to be proficient for the uh, grade 11 ACT is to look at the college readiness benchmark, walk those back down for, grade, for grades 9 and 10, and identify students who then would score below the ACT college readiness benchmark. But putting a lot of energy and attention on a test that's for all intents and purposes out of here doesn't seem like a good worthwhile investment. But I understand the need to identify students in grades nine and 10 who might not be on track. Um, there's a wealth of other information that you have about the students, um, even from his uh, middle grades years, as well as from teachers' grades and that kind of thing. And use all the data that are available to you. Please, for interventions in particular, do not just rely on or wait for results from a state test. Yes. I do want you to answer that, Mike. <laughs> that, that's an excellent question. Um, Can you repeat it for everybody else? The, the question is, uh, is there a minimum sample size needed for each scale score? Like uh, for each, uh, I think uh, a way to think of it is, um, uh, what do you call the student? Um, a kid? No. <laughs> 
for, for each uh, student, student uh, each group with the same test cohort. history. The cohort. That, that cohort. And uh, that, that kind of assumes that it's, that there is actually a sample of students with the same score history and that it's a large enough sample for, um, so that you can compute, a, you can actually compute a score for that sample. But what, what it is, it's, it's called the Colorado Growth Model, and in Wyoming we call it the Wyoming Growth Model. The word model uh, uh, is a clue that it's a statistical model. And uh, the, the important thing to keep in mind is that according to Damien Bietebener, the developer of this model, you need about 2,000 students per grade level cohort in order for this model to actually work. And in Wyoming, we have about 6,000 students per cohort, so we have plenty of students for the model to work. So it's a statistically modeled uh, student growth percentile rank. Thank you. Yes. So uh, this question is a really good one. Given that everyone in the state is required to use the Measures of Academic Progress map, and you already have growth reports available to you in MAP, she's asking, so how do the, the growth um, models used by MAP uh, and the growth scores achieved by kids compare to the growth scores achieved by kids on pause? And we don't know the answer to that question because we haven't done that particular study. Um, but we do need to, as long as MAP is being used in the state as an interim assessment to help predict students' performance, we absolutely need to do that. Kevin and I have had this conversation, actually. And um, uh, so we do plan to do that. I know Kevin actually has some data files that he's begun to take a peek at, uh, but it's not yet done. But it's a great question, and we need to answer it. Other questions? All right, hearing none, I'll turn it back over to Shelley. Thank you all very much.